What would you do if your toddler, one day over breakfast, started to refer to you as their other mother? Confused, you ask them who mommy number two is and they tell you that you're the second mother. They go on to tell you of a life they've already lived, their family, their siblings, even their death. You would be forgiven to dismiss these stories as proof as your child just has a wild imagination. Many parents do. But some stories are impossible to ignore and some parents are forced to reckon with them due to their children being haunted by the traumatic events surrounding what appears to be evidence of a former life. Welcome back to Red Room everyone. This week we're talking about reincarnation. Reincarnation is defined as a state of transmigration or metempsychosis in religion and in philosophy. It's the rebirth of an individual persisting after bodily death. It can be consciousness, mind, the soul, or something other entirely, existing in one or more successive existences. Depending upon the tradition, these existences might be human, animal, spiritual, and even in some cases, vegetable. The Venda of Southern Africa believes that when a person dies, the soul stays near the grave for a short time and seeks a new resting place in another body, human, mammalian, or, don't tell the conspiracy heads, even reptilian. The major religions that hold a belief in reincarnation, though, are typically traditional Asian religions, specifically Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and Sikhism all of which arose in India. They all hold in common a doctrine of karma, and that is the laws of cause and effect, or what one does in this present life will have effect in the next. There's no escape if you've misbehaved in these religions. So in Hinduism, the process of birth and rebirth is endless until one achieves something called moksha, Moksha is the liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth, and it's achieved by overcoming ignorance and desires, which is kind of a paradox in and of itself, because overcoming desires also includes overcoming the desire for moksha. Now, Jains believe that karma is a physical substance that's everywhere in the universe. They believe karma particles are attracted to the soul by the actions of that soul. After each bodily death, the soul, or jiva as they call it, is reborn into a different body to live another life until it achieves liberation. Buddhists believe that when someone dies, they'll be reborn again as something else and what they are reborn as depends on their actions in a previous life. Sikhism teaches a doctrine of reincarnation based on the Hindu view, but they also believe that after the last judgment, all souls will be absorbed by God. Now closer to home, Plato in the 5th to 4th century BCE believed in an immortal soul that participates in frequent incarnations. Christianity, and therefore the basis of much of Western society, does not believe in reincarnation at all. And being Irish, I'm all too aware of how we are to believe that we're born sinners and exist on this earth to repent our mortal sins in constant fear of eternal damnation that's promised to us, awaiting in the fiery belly of hell. Now, of course, not all forms of Christianity are quite as dramatic as Catholicism. However, they do reject the idea of reincarnation entirely because it goes against their beliefs and views of heaven and hell. Christians prefer to believe it only takes one life of good Christian living to be embraced for all eternity in God's heavenly kingdom. Maybe if they found out that screaming at innocent people outside family planning centres could result in them coming back as sinners they'd rethink their tactics. But anyway, reincarnation is not taken very seriously in much of Western society. But that doesn't mean that accounts of people claiming to have lived before do not exist. Quite the contrary. In today's episode, we'll be revisiting my series on past lives, one that is constantly requested by my listeners over on Patreon. People, including myself, can't get enough of these stories because they are fascinating. 
Now, before we get into it, you know what I'm going to say, whether you're watching, listening on any platform, Spotify, YouTube, whatever your podcast favorite app is, be sure to subscribe and follow me and you won't miss out next week's episode. And of course, leave me a review if you're feeling extra generous. Today, we're going to discuss some reincarnation cases that I haven't covered before, as well as the academic studies that has been conducted on this topic. So believers, skeptics, and everyone else, secure your tinfoil hats. And let's dive in. So as we mentioned before, the Eastern and Western hemispheres of the world have very different approaches to past life theories. It's said that in countries where Buddhism and Hinduism are practiced, children recounting stories of living before aren't seen as ridiculous or imaginary, but as proof of their karmic path. Oftentimes children nurtured in this manner will have memories of their former lives throughout their entire adult life or at least well into teenage years as their parents will encourage the conversation around them. In Europe and America, however, we often fall into one or two camps. Number one, our child is has a wonderfully colourful imagination uh, and will likely engage but treat it as a silly story or we dismiss their stories entirely. Some people have also accessed past lives through past life regression therapy, which we won't have time to go into today, but we have covered this extensively on Patreon, including interviewing a past life regression therapist. Now, the most common cases of past life memories come from children who often recount such memories between the ages of two to five. This is thought to happen because developmentally, the child can only begin to express and verbalize their experiences from around the age of two. Like, Imagine learning Goo Goo Gaga and trying to be like, Mommy, I lived through World War II, you know? And if they're not really being listened to and asked questions about their former life, they typically will stop remembering and recalling events around five to seven. So the stories being recalled seem to point to quite dramatic demises a lot of the time, which usually has skeptics saying, oh, I told you so, because they're kind of saying, oh, well, isn't it funny how every kid who comes back saying that they lived before was Princess Diana or was a survivor of the Titanic? And I get that. But it's thought that more dramatic stories are more likely to be told because children won't really think of anything that's kind of traumatic as anything but a normal memory. Um, it's, it's more de- mundane. It's also thought that if someone did die in a traumatic way, they're more likely to bring that memory into a next life. Now, speaking of skeptics, despite the opinions that belief or interest in past lives and reincarnation are just some sort of woo-woo shite or stuff of fairy tales, which I'm sure if we did some digging, these opinions are probably rooted in some xenophobia. That's a different story for a different day. There is plenty of research on the matter, though. Dr. Ian Stevenson was a Canadian-born psychiatrist based out of the University of Virginia, and he's best known for his pioneering work on the phenomenon of past life memories among young children. He described these in his landmark study, 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation, and many, many other publications. In the course of his 40 years doing this work, he researched three thousand cases of children who claim to remember past lives. He helped found the Society for Scientific Exploration in 1982 and was the author of roughly 300 papers and 14 books, all on reincarnation. I'm going to be talking about very young children because that's when these cases begin. And I'd like my first slide to show you some of the things that these young children may say. Uh, This is by no means a complete list, but uh, such remarks as when I was big, I was an airplane pilot. They may fill it out in different ways. The rejection of the mother, the disparagement of the immediate surroundings of the child, and something about what the child claims to have done previously. Let me show you uh, and tell you briefly about one case. Yes. Uh, This is a child of Lebanon, a Druze. It's a sect originally of Islamic origin, but now they consider themselves separately. She's uh, there about 18 months old, picking up the telephone and calling into it, Layla, Layla, Layla. When she could speak more, she spoke about a previous life uh, as a middle-aged married woman who had children, one of whom was called Layla. This deceased woman had died not long before 
our subject here was born. Here's the little girl when I first met her. Sorry, the slide isn't better. And she's here uh, between six and seven years old, still speaking fluently about the previous life. Here she is at the age of about 25 as a young lady, still unmarried, still very attached to the husband of the deceased woman. And here's the deceased woman herself. This case uh, illustrates not only the statements that these children make, but the behavior, the unusual behavior, the involvement with the other family. Now, his work was not without controversy. Stevenson has lots of critics. Some of them accuse him of asking leading questions and others just completely dismiss his findings as confirmation bias. That being said, today we're going to discuss two cases that are very, very compelling and super interesting. And I'm going to leave you to make your own mind up on the whole thing. So story number one. This story was shared on Carol Bauman's past life regression forum. Carol is an internationally known author, lecturer, counsellor, past life regression therapist and pioneer in reincarnation studies. She's appeared on Oprah, the BBC and she has said her own children's past life memories led her to do this research. So the post is from 2010 and a young mother writes of her own account with her daughter Lottie who began telling her about memories when she was about two years old. She said she is an avid journaler, and although her daughter is now older, I think she was around four when uh, the mother was writing this, she documented everything Lottie said, uh, with as many direct quotes as possible. The mother whose name, well, she shares a namesake with me, her name is Jenny, she claims to have really never thought about reincarnation before and said it was neither a believer or a non-believer. She was kind of just whatever about it. But when Lottie was two, she and her mother went out on a walk and Lottie turned to her mother and said, it's 1787. (laughs) Now, kids say some random shit, okay? But this took her by surprise because her daughter was so young that like the concept of the year... She didn't really have that yet. She had never even shown that she was aware of what year it was, never mind the year 1787. Now, a few weeks later, while on the bus, her mother told Lottie that she looked like a little lamb in her furry white hat. And Lottie began talking about how brushing the hair on a lamb to get all the dust out of it was very important. So her mom was questioning her. And she questioned Lottie and Lottie went quiet and changed the subject. She said she seemed really awkward and just didn't really want to talk much more. So her mother, you know, she brushed it off as just random stuff that toddlers say. But a few days later, Lottie says her name used to be Daisy Robinson. (laughs) So her mother was confused. She tried to think whether her and Lottie had ever met someone called Daisy or Robinson or, I know, if it was in one of her stories or the TV shows she was watching, but there was no one. A few days later, her mother asked her about sheep shearing and she told her that she used to make blankets. She said she had animals other than sheep as well. And she asked her if Lottie had been a boy or a girl, to which Lottie replied, a girl. Now, once when Lottie woke up from a nap, she started talking about the date 1787 again. And Jenny asked her if she remembered anything from back then. And Lottie replied, London Bridge is falling down. So Jenny researched into the history of this song and the nursery rhyme and found out that the earliest written version of the dates were from around 1744, despite Jenny thinking that it was from much later. So she added that Lottie has always loved this nursery rhyme and would always respond to it very positively when she was like a little baby. So she was very convinced at this point. Another day, Lottie went up to her mom in the kitchen and said, All the air came out of here, pointing to the middle of her body. She said, here, and I died, but I don't like talking about it. She said she looked sad and she kind of wandered away. Her mom said that this kind of shook her, you know, her little Lottie talking about death, because she had never really been aware of like the word death or dying. She'd never been around much death before. So she was kind of thinking like, I mean, I guess she's she's being sceptical. She's still questioning it and wondering where she would have heard this from, but nothing was coming up. Now, Lottie mentioned it once more after that, saying that she was 30 years old when she died and that the cause of death was from not eating anything. 
Her mother remembered that Lottie seemed to have an insatiable appetite when she was an infant. Apparently as a newborn, she would breastfeed hungrily for anything up to an hour at a time. And as a toddler, she would panic if you told her that they had no snacks when they were out. Now, like a lot of other kids, Lottie only told her stories in random outbursts, possibly when maybe a memory was triggered, but there's not really much research in it. Her mom said Lottie would be reluctant to talk about her past life when questioned directly, often just kind of saying nothing or kind of dismissing the questions, which she said was kind of out of character for Lottie. She was a very talkative little kid. Now, she only seemed to give information freely on her own terms. And Jenny says she took this very seriously. And when she was talking, she said it was a very si- like different vibe than when she was playing or, you know, pretending or d- playing make believe and Lottie would sometimes take days to answer a question something that Jenny found to be kind of fascinating because her little daughter had apparently been mulling over the question in her mind for days one day though Lottie did recall her experience of dying to her mother Jenny was telling Lottie about a childhood pet she had it was a dog called Maisie who had actually recently died Lottie asked her mom if she thinks Maisie will come back as another dog and Jenny replied I don't know Lottie said that Maisie won't be a new doggy yet because she only died a few weeks ago. She said that you spend a bit of time dead first. Then she told her mother that when she died, she turned to dust and floated into the sky. She said she stayed there for a while and came back as Lottie. She said she isn't afraid to die again, but it does make her sad because she likes being on earth. So in December 1982, a boy named Titu Singh was born in a village just outside of Agra, which is a city in India best known for being the home of the Taj Mahal. So according to his mother, Titu began speaking at 18 months. And if you've heard any other stories about reincarnation or children claiming past lives, you'll know that early development is a sign of this. So shortly after, he turned to his mother and said, tell my grandfather to look after my children and my wife. I am having my meals here and I'm worried about them. At the age of four, Tidu began to insist that his name was Suresh Verma and that his wife Uma and his two children lived in Agra and they were the owners of a radio shop. My name used to be Suresh Verma. I remember living in Agra, and I used to own a radio shop. He would beg his parents to take him back home and vocally rejected them as his real parents. He'd remark how his new life was not to his liking. He used to have a car and live in a city and now lived in a small farming village and had to walk everywhere. Titi would speak about having been murdered by two men, much to his parents' shock and horror. He said one day he arrived home in his car, honked his horn so his wife could open the gate, and suddenly two men came out running towards him and shot him in the head. He knew the names of the two men as well, claiming that the one that fired the shot was a businessman called Sedek Yoadin. Half curious and half sick of the wild stories coming out of their little boy's mouth, his older brother went to go find this shop. He needed to see if the shop existed. Now, Titu mentioned that like, he, it was a radio shop, but it also sold TVs and electronic goods, right? To his amazement, he did find a shop called Surish Radio Shop. He says he has a shop in Agra. <laughs> a wife named Uma, and two children named Ronu and Sonu. The shop sells VCRs, TVs, radios, everything. He went in and asked to see Suresh Verma. He was told that Suresh had been the owner of the shop, but he died several years ago. He asked for more information, and he was advised to go and visit the man's widow, Uma. Uma told him when they met that her husband had been shot in front of their house after returning home from work one day in his car. No one knew who'd shot him and therefore the murder had been still unsolved. She said Suresh had escaped hits on his life twice before in the past, so it's kind of safe to say that he was a little bit, a little bit bogey. I felt very odd and wondered what I would do. I talked it over with my parents-in-law. 
and decided to visit the family the next morning. Now, Titu's brother told Uma about his brother's claims to be her deceased husband, and Uma insisted on visiting Titu herself. I mean, I I know I would want to meet the toddler who's saying he's my dead husband. So when she told her family about the visit, Suresh's parents and his three brothers also wanted to come, and they decided to join her. So Titu saw his parents apparently coming down the driveway and his wife, and he was so happy he ran up to them hugging them, all of them embracing them. Apparently he was drumming on a stool with his hands to vent his joy. And this was something that Suresh was known to do even since he was a little child. After spending time together, the family was interested, but I mean, I think like anyone else, they needed more proof to see if this was their brother or husband or son reincarnated. And a decision was made with his parents' permission to take Titu to Agra and confirm his past life memories. Whose picture is that? Mine. What is your name? Suresh. When was it taken? Before I died. Suresh's brothers wanted Titu to show them the way to the radio shop. They tried to mislead him on purpose, but the four-year-old was not fooled. They told the driver to drive faster just as they were approaching the shop, and Titu shouted, stop, 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 this is where my shop is, and started pointing to the exact location. They told Uma's kids to play amongst all the other kids in the neighborhood on the street when they brought Titu around for the first time, and he was able to pick them out in the crowd. In total, Titu made 15 verified statements before meeting his former family and 31 subsequently, as well as correctly identifying 10 people and four places. The family were completely convinced. Titu kept in touch with Suresh's family and he visited them quite often. He seemed happier with the Verma family than he did with his own birth parents. Titu's mother says she sees Uma and Suresh's parents as part of her own family and they all seem to live in harmony. But his father has expressed fear that Titu is soon going to leave them because he would often remark about how their life was just not up to scratch for little Titu. Now Suresh's parents see him as their son. They recalled a story where they were walking in the street in Agra and they ran into a former nanny of Uma and Suresh's. She thought that Titu was one of Uma's children, to which he replied in horror, don't you remember me? Do you not know who I am? He knew her name and he could recall stories of reminding his children. It kind of blew their mind. Now, Suresh's relatives noticed that Titu had a small circular birthmark on the right temple that looked like a bullet entry wound and also a few small birthmarks on the back of his skull which they thought could be from the exit wound. They also noticed he had a birthmark on the crown of his head matching the one that Suresh had his entire life. When they checked Suresh's post-mortem they found that the entry wound was in the same place as Titu's birthmark on the right temple and that the exit wound had been behind his right ear. When they examined Titu, they found that his skull was somewhat pushed out behind his right ear. It was a deformity that his parents had noticed, but not connected to any shooting, obviously. Suresh's autopsy report notes that the bullet hit him on the right temple. It also shows the location of the wound. Curiously, there is a birthmark on Titu's head, which is the same size and in exactly the same spot. Now, as much as I'd love to tell you that Titu helped the police find Suresh's killer, I found various accounts online, but nothing conclusive. Some say he did and they hunted down the guy and he admitted to it, but I can't find anything that would solidify that question. Titi, however, is a real person and he now lives a very peaceful life under the radar. He earned a master's degree in yoga and naturopathy and since 2012, he's worked as an assistant professor at Banaras Hindu University teaching naturopathy and yoga therapy. That is all we have time for this week. I want to know which of these stories was your favorite. You can let me know in the comments or you can vote on the poll over on Spotify. Guys, subscribe and I'll see you all next week. 